When the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear device in August of 1949, some four years ahead of when Western intelligence services thought that they might, it created new challenges for Western defense planning. The United States had developed its first jet interceptor with the Northrop F-89 Scorpion, but against a nuclear-armed enemy, a jet interceptor just might not be enough, because if even one bomber got through, it would do enormous damage. And so the United States decided to fight nuclear weapons with nuclear weapons, mounting small nuclear warheads on missiles for air defense. The explosive force of a nuclear explosion reduced the need for pinpoint accuracy and increased the chance that the target bombers would be completely destroyed. But one of the first systems to mount these nuclear warheads had an accident within a year of being deployed, reminding us once again that when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, there's always a risk involved. The 1960 Bomark missile fire at McGuire Air Force Base deserves to be remembered. The Bomark missile system was developed for the United States as a joint project of the Boeing Corporation and the University of Michigan's Michigan Aeronautical Research Center. The name is a combination of the acronym for the two. At first, the weapon was designated as an unmanned interceptor, a guise that was required because technically ground-to-air missiles were the province of the U.S. Army, which was developing its own ground-to-air missiles. As the government became more concerned with vulnerability to attack, both the Army and Air Force projects were approved, and the missile was designated IM-99 for interceptor missile. The IM-99A had an operational radius of 200 miles. It was designed to fly at Mach 2.5 to 2.8 at a cruising altitude of 60,000 feet. While the project initially envisioned some 40 bases and 5,000 missiles in the U.S. and Canada, a change in emphasis from bombers to intercontinental ballistic missiles meant that deployment only actually occurred at eight sites in the U.S. and two in Canada, with a total of 409 missiles produced. The first of those would become operational in 1959. Declared operational in September 1959, the first Bomark site was Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst in Burlington County, New Jersey, approximately 16.1 miles southeast of Trenton. The Philadelphia Inquirer called the base location an area of scrubby pine forest with few residents that was suitably described as being in the middle of nowhere. The site, operated by the 46th Air Defense Missile Squadron, was composed of missile support buildings, an administration building, and the launch area. The 46th numbered over 300 officers and airmen. The launch area, or firing line, contained four rows of 14 concrete shelters. The semi-hardened shelters, nicknamed coffins, contained IM-99A missiles stored horizontally. The missiles were kept in ready storage condition, meaning that they could be launched in two minutes. After the launch order, the shelter's roof would slide open and the missile would be raised to vertical. The launch area included 56 Mode 2 launcher shelters. Each missile was 46.6 feet long, weighed 15,500 pounds, and could carry a 1,000-pound conventional warhead, or a W-40 nuclear warhead. The W-40 was a fusion-boosted fission nuclear warhead with a 7 to 10 kiloton yield, between approximately half to two-thirds of the yield of the Little Boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The warhead was considered to be lethal to a medium bomber aircraft up to about two-thirds of a mile. The warheads were mounted to the missiles for 90-day intervals, after which they underwent periodic inspection and maintenance. The missiles themselves also required periodic maintenance checks to ensure their rapid-firing capability. The Bomark A employed a liquid-fueled booster and two ramjets. In flight, the liquid-fueled rocket engine boosted the Bomark to Mach 2, when its ramjet engine, fueled by 80-octane gasoline, would take over for the remainder of the flight. Every 90 days, the missiles were defueled, decontaminated, and then refueled using pressurized helium to push the propellants out of the tanks. The liquid-fueled booster rockets used hypergolic fuel. A hypergolic propellant combination used in a rocket engine is one whose components spontaneously ignite when they come into contact with each other. The two propellant compounds usually consist of a fuel and an oxidizer. The main advantages of hypergolic propellants are that they can be stored as liquids at room temperature and that engines which are powered by them are easy to ignite reliably and repeatedly. This combination meant that the missiles would not have to have their fuel stored separately, requiring time to fuel the missile. However, hypergolic propellants are difficult to handle due to their extreme toxicity and corrosiveness. They are also highly explosive. If the red fuming nitric acid oxidizer came in contact with the aniline fuel, it would explode. The fuel was stored in the missiles, and there was a helium tank between the two that was pressurized during an alert for the 15 seconds it took to erect the missile into its vertical launch position. 
Less than a year after the base became operational, on June 7, 1960, at approximately 3 p.m., sensors in Shelter 204 at the Beaumark site detected a fire caused by an explosion. The helium tank that was set between the missile's fuel tanks became overpressurized and burst. The ensuing pressure shock ruptured the propellant tanks, causing their contents to spontaneously ignite. The fire then caused the remaining fuel to explode. The explosion sent shrapnel flying and blew off the shelter's corrugated steel roof and steel blast doors. The fire burned fiercely, spewing 20-foot-long blowtorch-like flames and black smoke drifted southward. Local firefighters responded to the alarm within three to five minutes. Albert Sweeney, a nearby farmer from Cooktown, was quoted in the Philadelphia Inquirer. I looked out across my open field. A mass of smoke was coming from the woods across the field. I thought it was a plane crash or that somehow the woods had caught fire. A nearby gas station owner named John Cairns was quoted in the Trenton, New Jersey newspaper, The Trentonian, saying it looked like smoke from a smokestack. The paper went on to say that was good news to him, at least it wasn't the dreaded mushroom cloud. Not yet, anyway. He told his wife to be ready to hop in the car and gun it out of there. Other locals were alerted by the response. The Enquirer quoted local factory worker James Nash. There was a flutter and a sputter and here were coming trucks and the like from Dix and McGuire. A former soldier from Fort Dix recalled the day of the event in the year 2000 edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Bertram Gratz was an Army reservist who was at Fort Dix for advanced infantry training. His squad was returning from the machine gun range when, quote, all hell broke loose. Gratz said, we were tired and all sweaty and dirty and we saw this puff of black smoke come up. There were sirens going off all over the place. Afraid that were the missile to explode, his squad would be in the blast radius, he said, Drop that stuff, meaning the machine guns, ammunition, and tripods, and let's get the hell out of here. The fire was exceptionally hot, as the Trentonian noted. It twisted the shelter's steel support beams like pieces of licorice and sent a massive black smoke plume swirling hundreds of feet into the air. The fire was confined to the single bunker and wasn't threatening other bunkers, but at that point the Air Force made a mistake. A sergeant contacted the state police, asking them to shut off some roads in the area. The request wasn't unusual. It was done under orders, but apparently the sergeant worded the request, well, poorly. As Brigadier General Gilbert L. Pritchard, who was commander of the New York Air Defense Sector, later told the Bridgewater, New Jersey Courier News, I am now sure that the sergeant either implied or stated that there had been a nuclear explosion. That news sent the state into action, as the Trentonian noted. At 3.15 p.m., the news had clattered in over the teletype at the State Police Troop C headquarters in Princeton. Atomic warhead explosion. The State Police alerted civil defense officials in Trenton and Burlington County to start assembling emergency equipment and to round up vehicles for mass evacuations. While the area civil defense organization was put on alert, military police, New Jersey State Police, and local emergency personnel isolated the area to prevent any spread of the fire and potential radiation. Base personnel and a handful of nearby residents were evacuated as a precaution. Firefighters from McGuire Air Force Base and Fort Dix fought the fire along with local volunteer departments. While the fire was contained within the shelter, it was nonetheless, according to the Inquirer, a difficult fire to fight. The fire burned for around 45 minutes and firefighters, despite their own potential radiation exposure, continued to pump water on the shelter throughout the night to cool down the remains and allow inspection by Air Force and Atomic Energy Commission experts. No one had been in the bunker at the time of the fire, and there were no reported deaths or injuries. The damage was contained to the bunker itself, but the missile, which newspapers at the time said cost between $1 and $1.2 million, was a total loss. At the time, following policy, the Air Force didn't even admit that a nuclear weapon was involved, but it was. The fire had burned so hot that the warhead had fallen into the molten metal as the missile collapsed. The weapon had not detonated, and in fact that was almost impossible because of its safeguards. General Pritchard said the bow marks are more foolproof than soap. An Air Force spokesman described them as as safe as the neighborhood gas station. In fact, the conventional high explosive intended to trigger the weapon had not even exploded in the fire. But detonation was not the only problem. Much of the device was made of thoriated magnesium. The New York Times explained, The metal, already radioactive, becomes highly radioactive when it is burned. As firefighters sprayed water on the wreckage for 15 hours, materials from the shelter flowed under the front shelter doors, down the asphalt apron and street between the row of shelters, and into the drainage ditch. Over the course of the next few days, General Pritchard apologized for the mistaken message that it caused an unnecessary civil defense drill, and the Air Force and local officials tried to reassure the public that few people were ever put in peril and that there was no radiation danger to the public. But inside the shelter, alpha radiation from the missile's plutonium registered over 2 million counts per minute. 
Inspectors needed special suits with respirators to protect them. After examining the remains of the warhead, the inspection determined that between 2 and 11 ounces of oxidized plutonium were unaccounted for. Still, the Air Force reported that contamination was restricted to an area immediately beneath the weapon, an adjacent elongated area approximately 100 feet long, and that spot checks had shown no trace of dispersed radiation outside the facility's boundaries. Philadelphia area authorities monitored air and water in the area, but reported no concerns. The area was fenced off. The remaining shelter structure and floor were sprayed with a special thick paint that effectively formed a barrier to the alpha radiation, and four inches of concrete were poured on the apron surrounding the entrance to Shelter 204. Eventually, some 10 acres were covered in concrete. But by 1980, the governor of New Jersey was questioning the extent of the contamination. An April 1996 report indicated that, in addition to plutonium contamination, there may have been more dangerous uranium. Among the concerns at the time, the Air Force reported that the missile launcher from Shelter 204 had been removed from the shelter shortly after the accident, and that no records about the manner of disposal of the missile launcher existed. The report recommended that potentially contaminated material be removed and shipped to a Department of Energy or private permitted disposal facility. Between 2002 and 2004, the shelter was demolished and over 20,000 cubic yards of plutonium contaminated soil was excavated and removed. But later analysis determined that the remediation had not addressed all impacted areas of the site. In a 2009 report, a remediation firm hired to do an analysis of the site, Cabrera Services of Hartford, Connecticut, indicated that the explosion and fire in Shelter 204 resulted in the release of not only weapons-grade plutonium, but also small quantities of weapons-grade uranium and depleted uranium within the confines of the site. Further remediation was completed in 2008 and 2009. The cleanup was not declared complete until 2010, nearly 50 years after the accident. The total cost of the cleanup was between 22 and 24 million dollars. Despite the initial claims, a 2013 study found the release of material to be comparable to that of the 1962 B-52 crash near Palomares, Spain. Despite the accident, the McGuire Bomark base remained active clear until October 1972 when all Bomark missiles were finally retired. The site has never been sold or changed to another purpose by the Air Force. It's still on McGuire Air Force Base grounds. It's been nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, although the actual site of the fire is still off limits due to low-level plutonium contamination. The event occurred during a tense period of the Cold War, just a month after the 1960 U-2 incident. The Soviets made some propaganda reports on the incident, claiming that parts of New York City had been evacuated in a panic and speculating that such an event could spark nuclear war. A statement released from Moscow on June 11th said, People are beginning to understand where the psychosis of American leaders could lead the country and the whole world. In the end, the safeguards on the Bomark missile succeeded. The warhead didn't explode even under extreme conditions. It's a testament to the exacting standards used in the design of both the missile and the warhead. But still, 50 years and $23 million of remediation reminds us that nothing to do with nuclear weapons is without risk. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>